It's a thrill today to introduce Adam Mans back. If you only know him as the author of the genius, mega best-selling, not for kids picture book, Go the F to Sleep, even though this is an adult content uh, tent, apparently, I could say the name, but, but I won't. <laughs> Um, then you need to get quickly up to speed and realize that he's something of a literary renaissance man who, in addition to writing novels, is proficient in several other genres, including graphic novels, poetry, screenplays. Uh, he's widely published in newspapers and literary journals, and he's also written a thriller, which will be out in September. He's here today to read from and discuss his latest novel, Rage is Back, which is set in the graffiti world with an 18-year-old protagonist who's the son of of two famous graffiti artists. His book has received great reviews, including one from Ron Charles, with whom he'll be in conversation today. And Ron Charles, as you surely know, is the fiction editor and book critic for the Washington Post. He's the winner of the 2008 National Book Critics Circle Award. And some of you may know him as the totally hip book reviewer. And if you don't, go home and uh, look up his videos on YouTube. Please help me welcome Ron Charles and Adam Mansbach. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly with Adam and the book, which I enjoyed so much. If you can't hear me, just uh, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll adjust. Adam, as Susan just said, you've written fiction, nonfiction, essays, uh, theater, uh, poetry, which I just learned uh, earlier today. It's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's face it, if we're trying to introduce you to, to someone who, who doesn't recognize your name, we say that title, Go the Frack to Sleep, and everyone recognizes that. I know you've told this story many, many times, but how did you come up with a book based on a phrase that every parent here has whispered under his breath <laughs> and turn it into a mega bestseller? Well, I had a two-year-old daughter at the time. <laughs> she just turned five. Uh, incidentally, my daughter knows the book as Go to Sleep, so if you meet my daughter, try to keep the lid on that one for as long as possible. Uh, you know, I, I staggered out of her bedroom one night bleary-eyed, dazed after a two-hour marathon attempt to get her to go the fuck to sleep, and uh, <laughs> jokingly posted on Facebook, be on the lookout for my forthcoming children's book, Go the Fuck to Sleep. And I had no intention of actually writing any such book. I was just kind of kidding. But as soon as I saw the words, you know, typed out, it sort of occurred to me that I, I knew what that book would look like and sound like and how it would interact with or, you know, ricochet off of the existing canon of bedtime literature, which in my household anyway, is very effective at getting the parents to go to sleep <laughs> and does nothing for the children. So, you know, it's it sort of, uh, and I, I continue to make that joke over the next couple of weeks. And then one day I sat down to see if I could do it. And I, you know, I enjoy working within parameters. And in this case, the challenge was, can I write a 14 stanza book with an A, B, C, B rhyme scheme, you know, and convey a, 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 an honest narrative about the, tribulations. It alludes to uh, Goodnight Moon in some ways, but you had other models in mind? You know, in my mind, it's it, it's sort of, I mean, in my mind, all of those board books are more or less, uh, they run together. You know, I mean, Goodnight Moon is the exception. Goodnight Moon is great. I'm a big Margaret Wise Brown fan. Yes. Um, <laughs> some of her later, lesser known works are, are particular favorites of mine. Um, but, uh, no, I didn't have Good Night, Good Night Moon particularly in mind. I mean, it was just sort of an amalgam of the spirit and the cutesiness and the cuddly animals that can be found in all of those books, yes. you know. And how did it go viral? Because that started even before it was published. It did. I mean, it started six months before it was originally intended to be published. So it's already uh, number one weeks before it appears, right? Yeah. How did that happen? It, it hit number one weeks before it was even printed. You know, and I mean, I don't want to be overly technical, but it didn't exist, you know? <laughs> like, it did not exist in the world. Um, I gave a reading of the book at a museum in Philadelphia in late April of 2011. Okay. Um, who, who comes to a reading like that? I mean, the book, do <laughs> the book doesn't exist yet. How do you get people to that reading? Right. Well, I was, I was one performer in a, what was intended to be a, a series, a sort of salon of 10 minute performances. So it was a real grab bag. There was a, a klezmer band, there was a 96 year old tap dancer who I went on directly afterward. And you, n you never want to follow a 96 year old, you know, like not on the freeway, not, not on stage. And, uh, she, and she was amazing. She got a standing ovation and she really was 96. Like she played, like she came up with the UB Blake Orchestra, 
okay? If you're a jazz fan of any kind. UB Blake died in 1980 at the age of like 160, <laughs> you know? And she didn't really understand she was only supposed to do 10 minutes, so she got her standing ovation and then like sashayed over to the piano player and was like, so for our next number? And they were like, uh, you gotta go. So I came on, I read the book. I had just gotten a finished PDF of the book from my illustrator. Okay. So I left my house thinking that if I could plug my computer in, I'd read Go the Fuck to Sleep, and if not, I'd read Rage's Back, which okay. I was finishing up at the time also. Right. Um, people reacted strongly to it and went home and began pre-ordering the book on Amazon, and the Amazon page had just gone up, and the thing took off and went viral, uh, which led to a lot of media which led to widespread piracy of the PDF, which we had also sent to booksellers oh. because we were afraid that nobody would stock this book. <laughs> and one of these booksellers leaked the PDF, meaning no harm, and then it was ricocheting all over the place. And, you know, I, I, we, and we were so stupid about it that we were trying to get everybody to stop. You know, we were, we were thinking this would cost us whatever sales yes. were forthcoming. So, you know, I remember noticing that a lot of the traffic was directed toward the Facebook page of a woman in Australia who had posted the entire book as an album. So I wrote to her and I was like, hey, listen, I, I'm glad you like the book, but you know, it's not out yet. Could you please take this down? Because you know, we'd like to sell a few copies eventually when the book comes out. And she wrote me back and said, I'm happy to take it down, but you should know that 500 people have written to me asking where they can find the book and I'm sending them all to Amazon. And I was like, okay, well, forget it then. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this is what the music industry needs to realize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how many copies have you sold so far? Uh, at this point, worldwide, it's probably one and a half million. <laughs> That's yeah. Now, I hear it's going to be a movie. How does that work? What is that? You know, al allegedly, it <laughs> is. Um, Fox 2000 bought the film rights, and uh, a, a screenwriter has been hired. A script is underway. I don't have too much input on this. I mean, my only plea to them is don't make it the stupidest, crassest possible version of the film. You know, don't make it about a bumbling father who can't get it together and doesn't know what to do with his kid and is basically like a caveman, which is the new sort of fatherhood yes. stereotype that's all over TV these days. Yes. You know, like the guy with the kid and the baby character who's like can't get the beer to his mouth because his baby's head is in the way. You know, yeah. like don't do that is my only plea to them. Um, they, t they said that the movie that they want to emulate in tone is Parenthood, which okay. is a good sign because that's a, a movie with a lot of heart and soul. It's a, about sort of an intergenerational family and kids and grandkids and parents and trying to sort of f figure out how to come together as a family. So if they do that or anything resembling that, I I'll have dodged a bullet. That'd be <laughs> nice, nice. Now you've got a radio show that has something to do with fatherhood, right? Yeah, I, I co-host a show uh, in, in, Berkeley? in Berkeley called uh, Father Figures. And uh, yeah, it's sort of an attempt to have conversations about parenthood that are a little more involved and reflect more about you know what it means to be a young parent today than some of what's in the in the broader discourse. You do that every week. Every week. We can hear that online too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I've archived. I've heard it online. Yeah. It's quite quite <laughs> nice. Now, in 2005, you published a novel called Angry Black White Boy about a suburban white kid who identifies very strongly with black culture. I take it there's some autobiographical impulse behind that book? Uh, in a sense, there is. I mean, the book is pretty fantastical. Uh, you know, it's a satire. It's about an Afrocentric white kid named Macon de Tournay who grows up in the suburbs of Boston, as I did, goes to Columbia University, as I did, starts driving a, a taxi cab, as I did not, and begins robbing all the white people who get in his cab and um, giving them sort of sh brief lectures on the invisibility and the, and the evils of, of whiteness and white privilege before robbing them and throwing them out. Um, he becomes kind of infamous, um, but nobody can put together the notion of a white kid committing racially motivated crimes against other white people, so instead the word goes out that some kind of militant black cab drivers robbing white people and New York is thrown into a panic and white people can't get cabs anymore or white people won't take cabs anymore which means black people can finally get cabs um, so you know I mean Macon and I share a lot of background and certainly I was a kid whose understanding of race was shaped profoundly by being involved in hip-hop at a young age at a time when it was one of the only sites in American life where whiteness was 
sort of dislocated from its per perceived position of, of centrality and normality. I mean, hip hop at that time in the late 80s and the early 90s was an overtly political site where things like uh, Eurocentricity and education and America's investment in South Africa's apartheid government were being explicitly discussed. Right. And so it was a place that I went to learn a lot. I mean, it's, it's 180 degrees from what hip hop is today in terms of content and meaning. How old are you? You're a teenager now? Yeah, I mean, this was, I mean, I started rhyming in 1986 when I was about 10. You know, okay. Run DMC, Raising Hell came out, and I was drawn to it, and I, it kind of went from there. Um, what did your parents think? I mean, you're a nice Jewish guy in uh, Newton, uh, Massachusetts, right? Yeah. Uh, what are they thinking about this? Well, you know, they were pretty supportive. I mean, first of all, I should say that by nine, by the time I was 13 or 14, I was doing many things that were much more objectionable to them. So hip-hop was <laughs> like, you know, like the lesser of many evils, you know. Um, they, they, they understood because at that time the music was so profoundly and explicitly political. You know, my father's a journalist. And uh, when Chuck D was talking about Joanne Chesimard, I could go to his shelf and figure out who that was. When, when KRS-One was referencing Elijah Muhammad or, or Bobby Seale or Stokely Carmichael, I could go to his shelf and figure out who those people were. He took me to see KRS-One lecture at Harvard University in 1989. They understood the connection between the, the, the poetry and the politics of it. I also have a, I come from a family where words are kind of our stock in trade. So, you know, my fascination with the language of hip hop made sense to them and my grandmother on my mother's side was a poet and her it sounds funny but hip-hop and her poetry were very similar in a sense she wrote brilliantly rhymed acerbic satirical verse really? and had a, a syndicated poetry column that appeared in the boston globe and other wow. papers called the muse of the week in review uh her name was felicia lamport and you know she wrote things you know like one of her more well-known pieces was uh, was called the love song of R. Milhouse Nixon. You know, <laughs> do I dare them to impeach? That kind of thing. So, I mean, That's nice. she, yeah, <laughs> she, she did her thing. So, you know, in a way, the notion of, of speaking truth to power and being politically biting, you know, there was like a through line from my grandmother through Gil Scott Heron through hip hop that I understood, and, and, you know, and Bob Dylan and Phil Oaks that my parents could understand and I could explain and we could kind of talk about. It. I mean, now, in Boston in 1990, the, the rap group that was most influential sartorially was a group called X-Clan, and they wore nose rings and big leather hats, and they walked with staffs, and they wore knee-high boots. And I rolled with a crew of guys. These were white people? or No, people? these are black people. Yeah. So my crew in high school was a bunch of people who dressed like that, and we would all troop into my basement to make music like every day after school. That was a little perplexing to my mom. You know, yeah. She was like, what, what's going on here? <clears throat> How'd you deal with the anxiety about being, you know, kind of a poser or intruding racially into a, into a culture that, you know, didn't want you, didn't validate you? I mean, that was something I was extremely conscious of because hip-hop forced you as a white kid at that time. You were exceptional. I mean, literally, you were the only one. So you had to negotiate that space, particularly when there were all these lyrics that were highlighting the history of white co-option and exploitation of yes. black culture. So how'd you deal so, with that? Um, in a number of ways. First of all, by wearing like a Malcolm X hat and t-shirt to every party so that people would ask me what I knew about Malcolm X so that I could tell them, so that I could prove that I was down. And, and the, 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 the sort of pathology of white kids in hip hop at that time was all about being exceptional, being the one cool white kid who was going to get validated and was always searching for that validation. So that was part of it, was like serially proving that I knew what I was doing and that I deserved to be there. But also, hip hop at that time was very much participation and skill based. So if you could do, if you could oh. prove, then you could, <clears throat> you could exist. And I was, I was an MC and I was good, you know, I could rhyme. So it all ultimately came down to that. But there was this sense always of wanting to, of taking very seriously the privilege of being allowed to participate and not wanting to do anything to jeopardize or violate that. And there was a process of separating the political from the personal because what, is, what do you mean? Well, a, a, a dominant ideology in hip hop at that time was the 5% ideology, the Nation of Gods and Earths, which is an offshoot of the Nation of Islam, started by Clarence 13X. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the elements of the doctrine is the notion that the white man is the devil. Okay. So 
a lot of people that I was friends with subscribed to this, you know? And a lot of rappers used 5 percenter terminology in their rhymes. People like Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, you know, Brand Newbie, and all of these groups that were very significant and important. And it took me a while to figure out how it was that I could be, you know, the, the white man who's the devil, but also be cool with all these people and spend half my time, like, crashing on their couches. Mm -hmm. So you learn to sort of find the fault line between the, the political and the personal in the sense that uh, there was this ideology, there was this rubric, but there was also a way through your own actions to perhaps transcend that in a way that was maybe more complicated for you than right. for anybody else. Right. I want to ask about how that relates to your writing. I mean, we, a lot of women authors write in the point of view of male characters, and some male writers write in the point of view of female characters, but you get very, very few white writers writing from the point of view of black characters. They're more likely to write about characters from outer space or a 15th century nobleman mm -hmm. than they are to adopt black voices. Mm -hmm. Why that anxiety? I mean, you do it. You've done it. I, you know, I've done it in a, in a limited kind of way. I mean, the narrator of Angry Black White Boy is a white kid, um, and in, in a sense, that's my attempt to remix the American race novel by making it about whiteness, which right. when you talk about race in America, really we should be talking about whiteness. That's the essential construct that has caused the rest of these problems. Um, Dondi, as you know, is, is a biracial kid and a kind of mover between different worlds and rages back. Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety because anytime you're moving from the center to the margins in terms of privilege, uh, you want to be very careful. And I think for a lot of white writers, that just results in paralysis or an inability to, to even attempt it. Uh -huh. My feeling is that if you're going to be a male writer writing a female character, a straight character writing a gay character, a white character writing a non-white character, the stakes are just higher. You just have to pull it off convincingly that much more, you know? Um, and I think, I think that a lot of white writers just, first of all, have no lived experience of being in the minority or moving in communities that are not their own, there's been an increasing trend in some sense sort of kind of navel-gazing fiction, particularly from young writers. Yes. There's almost been a schism, I would say, between, you know, it's like there's one strain of literature in the last 10 years, 15 years, which is sort of, you know, the, the immigrant experience, yes. you know, the first-generation American. Right. Um, those are mostly written by children of immigrants, don't you think? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, so mm. what it's like to be Haitian or Peruvian or whatever. And then almost, you know, in reaction to that or something, you have these younger white writers who are like, well, I don't want to get hemmed up in some kind of identity politics thing, and I'm just a regular white kid who went to regular schools and did regular shit, so I'm just going to retreat as far into myself as possible and write a bullshit novel about, like, you know, what it was like to go to college or whatever, you know, it's like, it's almost, I mean, I feel like it's a retreat from socially engaged fiction a lot of times, or it's a mea culpa, or it's, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't interest me, you know, I'd much rather deal with, on some level, the, the, the battlefields of race and class and religion, um, and explore these relationships. I mean, the, the reality of my experience um, is, a, is a multicultural one, is a multilingual one in the sense of speaking in different ways. I think the hip hop generation is instinctively able to code switch in a certain kind of way that we're very comfortable and ecstatic with. Um, code switch, can you? Uh, in the sense of being able to speak in a bunch of different ways. Okay. Um, you know, to, to move seamlessly between slang and high cultural classicism. You I mean, do that a lot in this book. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and you know, I think it's <clears throat> organic to the character, and I think it's organic to my, my generation. Like, everybody I know has that ability, and we don't, we don't sort of make it a hierarchy. You know, it's like Dondi in this book might at one moment be talking about Homer and the next be talking about Billy Joel, right. and they're on an equal playing field to him. And I think that, among other things, is a byproduct of a hip-hop aesthetic because it's a culture of pastiche, it's a, color, it's a culture of sampling, mm -hmm. and the source material is revered only for what it can impart, not for where it comes from. Nice. Very nice. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Your book is about, uh, I didn't, uh, <coughs> he's expelled from a high school student who's expelled from his ritzy prep school. Yeah. Uh, and then kicked out of his house. Yeah. S and so he's homeless, and uh, suddenly his dad is back after years away, and he falls in with this crowd of once famous graffiti artists. The book seemed infused with a great deal of nostalgia to me. Talk about that impulse and, and how you feel about this time. 
It was that time that Dondi looks, a time he really didn't know himself that he's looking back on. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think part of it, I, well, I wanted Dondi to be the lens through which this story was seen because he is an inheritor of all of this culture from his parents. Right. He's a second generation graffiti kid, hip hop kid, not because he wants to be, not because he sought it out the way you had to when I was growing up, when it was under the it's radar. It's just his, the fluid he lives in, right? Exactly, yeah. and he has no choice. And in some sense, it's boring to him. It's old man shit, you know? It's like <laughs> graffiti is what his father did and what his mother did, and right. that makes it lame and boring. And he's grown up around all of these people who, because of circumstance, are sort of forced to live in the past. Yes. Um, and so there's a nostalgia, but it's a complicated nostalgia because it's forced everybody into a certain kind of stasis. I mean, Dondi is a, is, is, a, is a child of the graffiti movement in New York City in the 70s and 80s when it was this vibrant outlaw art form and the city of New York fought a $300 million war against the writers. And by writers, I mean 13, 14, 15 year old kids. And by um, writers, you mean people spray painting things onto trains and walls. That's what I mean. Okay. And, and interestingly, they've always called themselves writers because the medium ultimately is words. And I think that's what first attracted me to graffiti was the notion that if they're calling themselves writers, then this is literature on some level. So what's the difference between graffiti and vandalism? Uh, the Venn diagram of graffiti and vandalism would have a, a broad intersection <laughs> middle part. Um, I think, I mean, I think the, the fascinating thing about graffiti to me is that it is both art and vandalism. And, you know, graffiti writers first began to interest me because uh, they were the weirdos of hip hop. They were the, 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 the theorists and the mad scientists and they worked in literal darkness and in obscurity. And there was no way to make any money off what they were doing. And they were just crazy, you know. And they had to embody a lot of paradoxes in their art and in their lives, and one was art and vandalism. And there was no attempt on their part to resolve those two things. They accepted that it was both. The public discourse on graffiti, those things were always butting up against each other. There were overzealous defenses of graffiti and uh, furious attacks on graffiti. You know, Mayor John Lindsay declared war on graffiti in 1972. That's pretty strong language. Yeah. I mean, when, when what you're really declaring war on is the underage members of your actual city who have been marginalized in various ways and are essentially, you know, crying out for some kind of recognition and attempting to navigate a city that has cut every source of funding for art, music, expression, schools are crumbling. I mean, these, these are black and brown kids from the Bronx and Brooklyn who figure out that by writing their names on trains, it will be seen by millions of people a day. He, that's who gets war declared on them. And it, there's a lot more at stake than just whether the trains are clean, obviously. But graffiti writers were the weirdos of hip-hop, and they were balancing art and vandalism, fame and anonymity, uh, beautification and destruction. I mean, these are the words they use to describe what they do. Um, and by 1990, the city had finally won the war on graffiti, putting these guys in the odd position of having outlived the thing they created. And that's, that's not, you know, that's, that's a particular kind of position to be in, you know. And it had gone worldwide, and a lot of these guys were famous, their names were known all over Europe and South America, but the, their thing, their art, no longer existed. It had been painted over, scraped off. Yeah, thousands. But by now there was some sort of critical context to discuss graffiti, whereas there wasn't when they were doing it, right? Well, I mean, within the, within the community of graffiti writers, there was always a critical okay. con a context. I mean, and that was always the primary audience, you know? Like, graffiti writers essentially always wrote for other graffiti writers. Really? Oh, okay. yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there were, I mean, there were exceptions to that in that, hey, it's, uh, it's December 24th, let's sneak into the yards and write a very legible, beautiful Merry Christmas mural with Mickey Mouse on it. That's for the public. But 99 out of 100 pieces that are written, the approval being sought, is and, and, and the aesthetic criteria by which a piece is to be judged is very much an in-group thing. You want fame among other writers. Everybody else is sort of besides the point. In 1982, uh, Q, uh, what's it, James Wilson uh, publishes a novel, uh, an essay, called uh, Broken, or it's now known as The Broken Windows Theory, yeah. uh, in which he says that if we take care of litter and graffiti, uh, we can reduce crime. Yeah. What's, what do we give up, though, when we scrape a city clean? You know, I think... I mean, New York is a better place now, right? 
than well, it was during that crime wave? I think in many ways it's a better place, but I don't think the absence of graffiti on the trains is really the reason. Okay. You know? I mean, I mean, the thing about the war on graffiti is that um, in, on, a, on a kind of philosophical level, it ushers in um, a lot of things that I think we should be very, very critical of. It ushers in be, through the, the framework of the broken window theory, which Moynihan and other people em, embrace. You know, it... Um, it opens the door for quality of life offenses and zero tolerance policies and the epic incarceration that particularly people of color face in this country, but you know, that has skyrocketed in, in the time since then right. to the point where we now imprison more people uh, than any other country you know, in, the, in the world by far. Um, and it's ushered in a certain kind of hypocrisy around uh, art and public space and, and youth and authority um, you know, nowadays, for instance, you can buy advertising space on the outside of a subway train right. in yes. New York City. Yes. For $50,000 a month, you can do whatever you want there. Except, you know, it can be a, a naked woman in a dog collar advertising vodka. No problem. CBS Outdoor administers all that for the, for the MTA. What you can't put on the outside of a train is anything that looks like graffiti. I tried to buy space and put these letters on the outside of the train and was not allowed to and the rationale was that the, the letters were graffiti style. Oh. Now, if the policy, as written, stipulates that graffiti is vandalism, is defacement, then, you know, a graffiti style letter is kind of like a, a, a robbery style purchase. You know, it's like, it doesn't actually make any sense intellectually, but the city is still so terrified of graffiti um, because of all that they freighted it with back then when it really became a, a thing about race and class and it's no coincidence that as graffiti became harder to read as as wild style developed and the letters began to be camouflaged and connected and interlocking or shatter into bits enforcement stepped up dramatically because suddenly not only was a conversation happening on the trains but it was illegible to most people you know and so there's a lot that of that was offensive involved. Yeah, apparently so. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. You know, nobody likes abstract art, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I could do that myself. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> <clears throat> the rage is back. Uh, rage. It, when we were growing up, when I was growing up, I'm older than you. Uh, Slightly. The left seemed to have all the rage. Mm. Now the right seems to have all the rage, and the left seems kind of comfortable and suburban and, and yeah. satisfied. Uh, is there something of that going on in your title there? Talk about the issue of rage and that's, what you were thinking. That's an excellent point. Um, I think you're right that the, the rage and the indignity have shifted dramatically, and yeah, it is embodied much more in a, in a public sense by, you know, by the Tea Party, by the people who are uh, indignant about the notion that their ability to buy 100 magazine, you know, clip is going to be impeded, right. um, that they're going to be tread on in some kind of way. Um, yeah, I mean, the character Billy Rage, Rage is his graffiti name, um, and in some sense, you know, a as, as many pen names are for writers, some kind of embodiment of, of what he is. And I mean, he writes with a ferocity and a fury um, that allows him to do and go what other people can't and won't where and what I lost track of that sentence a little bit but uh, <laughs> no, you're too many about his rage right Billy's rage yeah um and yeah in a sense his return and the and the shenanigans that come along with it as he and these other writers from this era right. stage this epic comeback and try to retake the trains yeah is a return of a certain kind of rage I guess have you ever done any graffiti yourself uh yeah I've dabbled you know I I realized well, when I was coming up in hip hop, you were expected to be conversant in at least two and preferably three of the four basic art forms. So you were expected to be able to rhyme, yes. DJ, dance, and do graffiti. At least, at least two, preferably three. Yes. So I was primarily an MC and then a DJ, never a good dancer. And I, I tried my hand at graffiti and quickly realized I was not very good at it. So I sort of, I, I mean, I have a couple of rests on my, you know, my record. Um, I did a little bit, but I, I demoted myself to lookout pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, I am an excellent lookout. If anybody needs a lookout, a freelance lookout, just let me know. Could you read a passage? Sure. <laughs> how, what and how long would I, would I? Whatever you'd like, really. Like something uh, that gives us a sense of the book. A sense uh, of the man. voice, really. Okay. All right. Uh, let, me, let me find something brief to. So, uh, so Don D, the 18-year-old the narrator, um, has been expelled from his school, which he refers to throughout the book only as Whoop-dee-woo, Ivy League, Weezer Cummins Academy. 
and his mother has thrown him out of their apartment, so he's sort of couch surfing. And uh, this is early in the book when he is discussing uh, his next destination, which he's going to reach by traveling up a staircase, which, uh, if you walk all 15 flights of stairs, catapults you 24 hours into the future. Um, which he realizes is kind of a difficult sell for the reader. And he's a, he's a narrator who's very, like, self-aware in terms of the fact that he's writing a book and also is very aware of the fact that he doesn't really know how to write a book. So this is him sort of easing us toward this discussion of this staircase. Um, he's just sort of told the reader, uh, all right, well, I, I, all right. He, yeah. So he's talking about the building. Your boy here... I figured out as much as I needed to know and then left it alone. I'm crap at science to begin with, so if there's some monumental discovery about wormholes and the rending of space-time to be made, I'm not going to be the guy who makes it. Nor am I foolish enough to run my mouth and blow my own spot, end up getting my foot run over by Stephen Hawking's wheelchair or some shit. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be mysterious. The deal is this. If you enter the stairwell of this building at lobby level and walk all 14 flights of stairs, which nobody would since there's a very nice elevator tricked out with mirrors and wood paneling and it always seems to be idling right there, doors open no less, you emerge on the top floor having traveled exactly 24 hours into the future. And no, smart guy, you can't walk down and go back. That would be hot, obviously. You could make a fortune like the dude in Back to the Future Part 2. It was the first thing I tried. I'm going to say this once and then I promise I won't come back to it or even address the reader in second person anymore, which I can see getting annoying very quickly, seeing as most people want to lose themselves in stories, not open a book and have a finger pointing at them all the time, unless it's a pop-up book. If you're already frowning and thinking I'm an unreliable narrator or going, oh goody, I love magical realism, you should probably cut your losses and go read Tuesdays with Maury before I get to the really wild shit later on. Skepticism is an admirable trait, but so is asking yourself if you're really such a fucking master of the universe that things might not be happening beneath the surface of your world right now without you knowing. Or even in midair when your back's turned. I mean, hell, they didn't discover the duck-billed platypus until 1896 and everybody thought it was a hoax because mammals aren't supposed to lay eggs, you feel me? I'll stop there. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> That the character is a charming narrator, really funny and Thank smart you. and very, very sympathetic. I, I had a good time writing him. It, it shows. It's, yeah. it's a very enjoyable book to read. Your next book is a horror thriller. I couldn't get information about it. Uh, some sort of political allegory, too, it seems like to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you no, know it's I mean, already out, right? No, it comes I mean, out in it's, September. I mean, it's already oh, submitted. It's done. You're yeah. done. I'm surprised yeah. you don't have a copy already. <coughs> probably in we'll the book have to room. to speak somewhere. to somebody about that. Oh. Um, yeah, Something you know. about immigration? Well, I mean, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a supernatural thriller. It's called The Dead Run. And, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, like, I, I really enjoy getting to know different genres and trying to figure out what the rules and the parameters of them are. Okay. Um, you know, my first love in terms of writing and words was hip-hop, and there are no stricter parameters than writing a rhyme that has to be in 4-4 four, four and work over a 92-beat-per-minute beat and, you know, do all these things. So... When I was presented with the opportunity to write a thriller, I was sort of fascinated with the notion of learning a new set of rules. You know, how do these things work? You know, okay, you know, four interchanging points of view and moving the plot relentlessly forward and uh, ending every chapter on a cliffhanger and that kind of stuff. And, you know, really seeing how much I could get away with. Do you mock those conventions in the book the way you do in this book? Um, no, not, not, okay. not, so not, totally not as such. I mean, it's, it's, it's got, I mean, my approach on a deeper level to approaching, to writing a thriller is that the whole thing should sound like it's being spoken in voiceover by Bruce Willis, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, it, by, by holding fast to that rule, I think I did a pretty good job. I mean, the book, the book is about an American prisoner in a Mexican prison who is forced by an ancient priest who stole the superhuman powers of an ancient Aztec god to carry the beating heart of a, of a virgin across the desert and deliver it to this guy's son so that he can consume it and take on the powers of his father. Meanwhile, there are all of these uh, women, girls buried in the desert who've had this heart removed from them, who sense the presence of the heart and come to life and try to seize it back. 
And then there's the prisoner's daughter has been kidnapped by the same cult that he's taking the heart to, and there's a sheriff and a psychologist who are on the hunt, and it's I mean it's fucking insane. I mean it's ridiculous, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean it was a lot of fun to write, and I think uh, I don't know. I think it's good. It was fun to it's fun to take a stab at a Great. so to speak at a, <laughs> yeah. at a book like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> now some people here have manuscripts in their drawer, collecting dust. Can you tell us about a project that you did that just did not work out? I mean, here you are, a successful author. It would help to hear that not everything you do is a bestseller. I mean, very few things that I do are bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, um, almost nothing that I've ever done is a bestseller. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always juggling projects, and at any given time, there are a couple that may never see the light of day. I mean... You know, particularly as I move into the world of screenwriting and television writing, um, you know, those industries are so bizarre that they make publishing look slightly less bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, when I when Go the Fuck to Sleep came out, and we ended up publishing it much earlier, we got it out in time for Father's Day of 2011. At that time, you know, I was finishing up a two-year stint teaching at Rutgers. I was about to return to California, return to my mortgage, you know, and, and, and I was terrified, and I'd been frantically turning out work for about three years, Rage's Back, The Dead Run, a couple of screenplays, and, you know, I was able to seize the moment and the opportunities availed by Go the Fuck to Sleep to sell a lot of that stuff, but... I mean, that was a, 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 a whole dresser drawer's worth of stuff <laughs> that had been accumulated in those three years as I was trying to figure out what was going to stick and how to make a living, you know, moving forward. I mean, right. the state of publishing is, is not good, no, frankly. It's not good. You know, it's a, no. The goal now is to, is to just see it through to the end, yes. you know, see publishing through to the end. Yes. Like, watch it, watch it implode and... and <laughs> Tell your kids about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, you... Teaching writing, is that just something to keep authors employed near the end of publishing, or can it actually be done? <laughs> um, I think that you can make – I mean, so my, my, my best teaching experiences have been with graduate students writing fiction and screenwriting. And I think that you can, you can teach anybody to be a better and more insightful reader. Yes. You can teach them to peel away the layers of their own opinions until they get to the core so that they are – not misdiagnosing problems, which is what often happens in a workshop, is everybody realizes the story isn't clicking, everybody has a different opinion of why, and it usually boils down to character, but people think it's plot, they think it's dialogue, they think it's any number of things. Um, you can't multiply zero, though. You know, I mean, people, yeah, not anybody in you my opinion. You didn't write that on anyone's paper, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I didn't. That's devastating. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it needs to be said sometimes, but I don't, I'm not going to be the guy who says it. I think you can, you can certainly make people better writers. You can give them a lot of craft and technique and, and, and make them think about things that they might not otherwise. I got through my entire program. I went to an MFA program, and I emerged from it not really understanding that there was a thing called point of view. Like, I had, to f I had to learn that later in the streets, you know what I mean? Like, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I wanted to impart basic concepts and structural building blocks and make people read and make people think in a certain kind of way and build a certain kind of classroom atmosphere that was conducive to camaraderie and companionship and support and all of those was far right. you know, w warm, fuzzy kinds of things. Those are good things. Yeah, but um, no, but ultimately I don't think you can – you can't – you can't build a writer from, from the ground up. Right. Would you take some questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, we don't have a mic, so just, do we have a mic? We do. We'll just wait for it, stand up, and, uh, and ask anything you'd like, I think. Within reason. Within reason. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, your reading was so compelling. I have to ask you, is there an audio book of... Rage is back. There is. Did yeah. you do it, or did, was there another actor? Um, I didn't do it, but it was done by a, a f well, it was, it's a three-person cast. Oh. The majority of the book is performed by Danny Hawk, who is a great actor and playwright, and an old friend of mine who, I, who got the part completely independent of our relationship. They sent me a bunch of audition tapes, and he was one of them, and I was like, of course, why didn't I think of this? 
Danny is great. I mean, he, he did a one-man show called Jails, Hospitals, and Hip Hop, and another one called Some People. And he's great for this because he's able to do all kinds of voices. Um, so he does the bulk of it, and there's a cameo uh, by the Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan who performs one chapter, and another, uh, the, the narration is sort of handed off twice in the book, so Jizza does one chapter masterfully, and Wyatt Senak from The Daily Show does another chapter. Oh, so I can't bring myself to listen to the book on tape for uh, reasons that are complicated or maybe obvious, um, but I think it's probably excellent. <laughs> I can also come to your house and read the book to you. <laughs> I'm available. Yeah, generally available. You said, um, you said you've been looking at different formats to see what would stick from your drawer. And now that things are sticking, are you wanting to go in a certain direction? Like, I'd really only want to do screenplays, or you know, have you made up your mind about that? I mean, no. I mean, the the beauty of having the kind of space that I that I have right now, um, and being able to pick and choose projects, is that I can I can sort of do them all. I can I can keep writing literary fiction. I can do the screenplay thing. I mean, the things that at the moment are holding my attention most are sort of widely diverse. Um, I'm. I've got a couple of TV projects. I just I just pitched a show uh, last week with a, with a childhood friend of mine, a writer and film director named Andrew Bajowski. We have a, a thing we're trying to put together. The, I'll give you the two-word pitch. You guys ready for the two-word pitch? The, ele the falling down an elevator shaft pitch? Super bad lieutenant. And I'm out. Thank you. Um, that's the show that we're trying to do right now. Um, I'm, I'm writing a young adult book with Alan Zwei Bell, who's a, a very funny guy, one of the original writers of Saturday Night Live, who I met at a book festival a couple of months ago, and we started talking, and now we're writing a, a book featuring time travel and Ben Franklin. Um, uh, I, I, I went to the Sundance uh, Screenwriters Lab with a project last year, so I'm trying to make that happen as a feature film. I have the thriller coming out. So, no, I mean, the, the, the nice thing about where I'm at right now is that I can kind of like spread out and keep all of these projects on different burners and try to keep anything from boiling over or going cold, if that makes any sense as a metaphor, which it doesn't. <laughs> that is sort of the life of the writer nowadays, isn't it? It kind of has to be, yeah. I mean, as, I mean most of my friends who are writers, and most of my friends are writers, <laughs> because I need people to drink coffee with at like 2 p.m., um, <laughs> are trying to figure out how to make a living as it becomes less and less feasible to just write novels and publish them and get advances. Everybody's looking to teach or to do TV or to do movies. It's a pretty fraught time as, as, as these things go. Hi, Adam. Um, I met you years ago. I wrote about your first book, Shackling Waters, um, which was really interesting. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed watching your career. Um, I wanted to ask you about the piece that you wrote in Salon about, um, you know, writing and being a writing professor. I mean, you, you, right now you were sort of painting kind of a cynical look at the kind of, I guess, craft of teaching, writing, and you know, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that. And I mean, the reality is, is some people, in order to be continue to be writers, are going to have to teach. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of response did you get from the salon piece? And I mean, I know it sort of blew up on the internet. Um, you talking about the syllabus piece? Yeah, yeah, the okay. piece about yeah. Um, yeah. So I wrote a, uh, <laughs> I wrote a, 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 a couple of humor pieces for salon um, over the past few months, and one of them was a fake syllabus, uh, which was basically like. Like a, like a brutally honest syllabus, like what a, what a syllabus would say if you were being honest about what a class looked like. Um, I, pretty much, shockingly, the, the response to that piece was like almost entirely positive. Um, a, lot of, a lot of professors reached out to me and told me that it was very affirming for them to read that piece. A lot of, and I've read that piece for college audiences and it goes over very well because it's very true. Like, um, it is cynical, uh, but, it, but it's, it's pretty much grounded in reality. I mean, when you read that piece to a room full of college students and, you know, I get to the part where it's like, I don't know, stuff about sitting in class with your laptop open pretending to take notes but actually being on Facebook, they know they do that. 
so they laugh. Um, yeah, the, 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 that piece um, hasn't... I, I can't remember really much backlash to that piece. It was, it was like, I think, a lot of times when you write humor pieces and, and send them off into the world, you run into the problem of people not having a sense of humor and taking it very seriously and earnestly and, and thinking you're an asshole. Um, but that piece, less so than others that I've written, was 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 met with with res I mean it, it was met with less resistance than than any other humor piece that I've written recently actually I think There's also a very funny piece you wrote for Salon about the trial of doing book readings which you mustn't miss That's exactly what I was going to ask about so I figure you're alluding to that you want to talk about the reaction you got to the book tour uh humor piece you wrote for Salon yeah, that was a little more divided. Um, I mean... Read this passage. Okay. Uh, uh, print. Ron has a... Uh, all right. This is an excerpt. Yeah, it's, it, it was a, a diary of my book tour, basically, that I wrote before my book tour. Um, a lot can go wrong on a book tour. For instance, stop me if I'm getting too technical here, nobody shows up to the reading. When this happens, you're forced to spend about 20 minutes with an apologetic, pitying bookstore employee attempting to strike the right blend of self-deprecation, cavalier disregard, and passive aggression toward the bookstore for failing to promote the event in any way except by placing posters in the bathroom of the store itself. This bathroom is not for customer use. Um, I mean, again, I mean, this, this is where the interwebs become funny. Like, the overwhelming response to that piece also was that people thought it was funny. But there were like, five to 15 people who thought that it wasn't and that I was an asshole and that I should just be grateful that I got to publish books and so forth and so on, who kind of like missed the point of the piece, which was to be funny and also be self-deprecating, who were like, he's an asshole, fuck this guy. And of course, somebody, you know, decided that they would fill up some space on their website by writing a piece about the controversy engendered by this piece. So they interviewed literally 100% of the people offended by the piece and then acted like opinion was divided. You know what I mean? It was like, and it was like, okay, really? You know? Slow news day, huh? Um, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I've come to understand that even the most innocuous uh, humor piece will be met by a certain percentage of people who just shouldn't be allowed to read humor pieces. You know, like, I wrote another piece uh, for Esquire that was about the Viking uh, Random House, the Penguin Random House merger, right? And it was funny, because I did three novels with Random House and escaped to Penguin for this book, and then they merged with Random House like two weeks later. Um, so the conceit of that piece was that I was revealing the, uh, the, 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 the fall, you know, 2014 Penguin Random House list, and it was it was a mashup of all Random House meets Penguin titles, you know, like um, you know, who moved my cheese as I lay dying and stuff like that, you know, like, um, you know, and but like somehow people managed to be offended by that, you know, like I don't even really understand why. Incidentally, the reason that publishing is is so messed up right now is that. You can see it in the in the Penguin Random House merger, right? Like, there are several possible names for that new company. Random Penguin. <laughs> Penguin House. What do they go with? The least interesting of all possible alternatives. Like, this is what got you guys into this mess to begin with. C you, you could have been Random Penguin. That would have been a good look, you know? <laughs> like, come on, you know? Anything else? This has been great fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. <laughs>